Greetings historians, welcome to Lord the Dragon. Today we'll be delving into the world of Azeroth and talking about a species known as the Drakthir, of their beginnings, or rather their origins, up to the point where they are made to separate into their different and respective allegiances by forces beyond their home. Let us delve into their history and delve into their culture. 20,000 years ago, when the dragons watched over the world from their home in the Dragon Isles, a threat loomed over the horizon. The Primalists, the precursor cousins to the true dragons we know, rather known as the Proto-Dragons, rejected those who gifted the dragons with their newfound magic, the Titans. These five dragons became what are known as Dragon Aspects, head of what are called the Dragon Flights. The Primalists believe the Proto-Dragons, of which the Dragon Aspects were once a part of, should stick to the roots of elemental energy. Leading them would be Razageth, whom possessed great power in her own right. After relations had soured between the Dragon Aspects and the Primalists, after the Dragon Aspects rejected the Primalists' demand to remove a Titan from their home, known as Keeper Tyre, the Proto-Dragons would begin to fester discontent with their magically gifted cousins. Rising tensions between the two species pose a threat to the world, called Azeroth, of which the dragons were tasked to defend by the Titans. With this oncoming threat of rebellion came the issue of how to deal with it, and many opinions were most likely shared. However, the ones that we'll be focusing on are of Alexstrasza of the Red Dragon Flight, Queen of the Dragons, and Notharian, leader of the Black Dragon Flight, and known as the Earth Warder. Alexstrasza, who even in their proto-dragon days was more compassionate in their approach to issues, believed in a peaceful solution with the Primalists, while the more battle-eager Notharian saw another solution, or rather inevitability, that this would only end on the field of battle. But war was a risky option, especially given the resources at the Dragonflight's disposal. Dragonkin, or rather, sort of dragon half-breeds with other races, were not equipped to fight the war Naltharian saw coming. The Draconid were slow, as Naltharian put it. The dragon spawn were easy to beat. Their abilities would not help them, even if they were loyal to the dragons. So, inspired by the rising mortal races of the world, so capable and strong, he set out to combine the essences of the dragons with the mortal races. The road to the Drakthir's creation, however, was not simple, nor pleasant. In the halls of Abaris, Naltharine would take the Draconids and experiment on them or contort them to find the species that he wanted to bring to reality. In time, their legacy would be brought forth through this twisted practice in a final iteration, and thus the Drakthir were created. Soon they were assembled into an army and sent to the Forbidden Reach, where they would train on the Dragon Isles. To ensure their loyalty, he used the Oathbinder, a titan relic that would bend them to his will. Through it, he would be able to keep this newer, more clever dragonkin in check. Due to their existence as an army, a command structure was put in place, along with what some might call battalions, or rather, as the Drakthir call it, a wern, led by a scale commander. At this point in history, there were the Obsidian Warders, led by Azurathel, charged with the defense of their allies and allied fortifications, the Dark Talons, led by Cinderthrush, who were tasked to be an elite force for the Black Dragonflight, focusing on offense. The Healing Wings, led by Viridia, which, like their name suggested, are healers and menders who preserve life through the power of time and the Emerald Dream, a pure and untouched version of the world of Azeroth. The Ebon Scales, led by Sarkareth, who cast magic down upon the foes of Naltharian and whose loyalty to the Earthbinder was great as well as their hostile nature toward anyone. And finally, Adamant Vigil, led by Emberthal, who were the eyes and ears of the Black Dragonflight and for the Drakthir army. 
Then the day came, and the Primalists started their fight against the Dragonflights. In this fight, many were lost, and the Oathbinder was destroyed. However, the threat was subdued. The Primalist leader, Razageth, was sealed away using a dark and ancient magic. Now, despite their victory, there was a possible new threat. Worry grew that without the Oathbinder, the Drakthir, who had helped in subduing the Primalists, could perhaps become a larger issue and threat. So the aspects of the Black and Blue Dragonflights, Naltharian and Malagos respectively, planned to seal the Drakthir away. Soon, Naltharian ordered the Drakthir underneath the Forbidden Reach into what were called Crushes, where they would disappear from the world, sealed and left in a deep slumber for 20,000 years. Many years had passed since the Drakthir were sealed away. The world had changed greatly. However, the threat posed to the Dragon Isles and to the world of Azeroth would be one far too familiar for the Drakthir. A surge of energy went through the Dragon Isles. A beacon was lit, and those far from its land were called to it. Across the Dragon Isle, the Warrens awake to a new world, held back from leaving their crush by those loyal to Malagos. Many of the Warrens found their escape difficult. The Dark Talons and Obsidian Warders fought with a blue dragon known as Lapisigos and his dragonkin support. Although, like the Evan Scales, dealt with their foe in a decisive battle. The Healing Wings found themselves in a precarious situation as their crush had been filled with a toxin, consuming both their captors and them alike. Now, here we'll turn to the story of Emberthal, as in a way it ties into the greater story of the Drakthir. Emberthal slowly made their way through the tunnels of the crush, until she encounters an unfamiliar but powerful entity. This entity would be the head of the bronze dragonflight, Nazdormu. As he was given the power by the titans to peer through all time, to see all time, he showed her the beginnings of the dragons, Neltharion's fall to darkness, and his eventual demise at the hands of foreign champions. She was hesitant to believe it, struggling to believe that their general would lock them away and go on to become one of Azroth's greatest threats. Though the reason why he did this was not known to her or exactly to Nazdormu. Through her past, however, she showed Nazdormu when the seeds of Natharian's corruption began. And there was a hope. In it, he mentioned that perhaps Natharian put them in a slumber so that one day they could return, perhaps for the purpose of defending Azeroth once more, just at a later date that perhaps he didn't even know. Eventually, the Wern's Obsidian Warders and Dark Talons are able to regroup with Emberthal, the latter finding them escaping their crushes, just after defending an arcane beacon of sorts from a race known as the Taurasek. From this beacon came a vision to one of the Drakthir, of the other Wern's in distress, and it took little time for a relief effort to be put into action. But, in the short time they had to speak, Emberthal mentioned that she was relieved to see that the Wurns of Obsidian Warders and Dark Talons were safe. But when asked about her own adamant vigil, she simply said that while she was able to walk out of the crush, the rest of her Wurn were not as fortunate. But there was nothing they could do. And for the already injured of the Drakthir, the Healing Wings were a priority to save, as well as strengthening their numbers with the Ebon Scales. So, Emberthal ordered Scale Commander Cinder Thresh and a Dragthir to relieve the Healing Wings, while another, called Dereshion, was sent to ascertain the true situation of Ebon Scales. After that, they were ordered to gather the Wurns and unite their strengths together. The Healing Wings, along with the Draconid that tried to hold them in their crush, had been afflicted with the toxin from a species known as the Scythid. However, they were assisted in their efforts to recover and heal their wounds by the Relief Force. And it's in these moments that you see there's a rather strong bond between Scale Commander Viridia and Scale Commander Cinder Thrush. Eventually, an antidote was created for this toxin, and the Drakthir of the Healing Wings had it distributed between them. But 
In line with their nature, Viridia instructed the Draconid to be given it along with being healed of their wounds. The Draconid had not only had the rumors of the Drakthir being such a big threat disproven, but they found a sense of loyalty to their healers. They would join the healing wings, and one of them would be called Artrenosh Hailstone. The Draconid later would help the Drakthir with the threats ahead, and help the Drakthir through precarious situations. Soon, word reached Emberthal of Eben Scale's true situation, and again a relief force of Scale Commander Azurathel and another Drakthir was sent to assist. Upon fighting back their assailants, Eben Scale's Scale Commander, Sakareth was hesitant to obey the order of Emberthal, saying that only the Earth Warder had the right to order them around. But understanding the threat that stood before them, and remembering what sort of threat that these forces were, he ordered his warren to obey once they recovered. Unfortunately for them and for the soon-to-be-coming forces of the Alliance and Horde, upon discovering the Dragon Isles, this threat that fought against the Drakthir was none other than the Primalists, who, after pushing through the Drakthir defenses, breached a site known as the Froststone Vault. This led to the release of the Primalist leader, Razageth. She mocked the Drakthir, proclaiming their general, Natharian, was no more. A storm brewed overhead because of their presence, a show of Razageth's power, and the Drakthir were forced to make a hasty retreat. They would be assisted and assist two members of the Black Dragonflight who just appeared, but it would be the presence of Nazdormu that was enough to make Razageth retreat. But the turmoil would not be over for the Drakthir. Many among the Drakthir, particularly the Ebon Scales and Sakareth, demanded to know if their general was truly gone, angered by the prospect that he had just locked them away, leaving them to the whims of another dragon aspect, and unable to tell them why himself. Unfortunately, one of them, the black dragon known as Rathion, would confirm this, saying that it was rather a complex situation. So as the other words of Obsidian Warders departed for the alliance with the Black Dragon Rathion, and the Dark Talons with Abyssian to the Horde, Sakareth proclaimed their vow to serve the dragons was sundered, citing the actions of Notharion. Using this terminology, he and his Wern took upon the name the Sundered Flame, and departed to set their own course free from the dragons. Emberthal would stay behind to find survivors, to lead their people from their home, while the Healing Wings and Viridia stayed behind to tend to the wounded and their newly acquired Draconid. This was hard on Scale Commander Cinderthrush, as both she and Viridia again had a close bond. Though duty pulled them apart, they hoped it wouldn't be for long. So, the Obsidian Warders and the Dark Talons set off for foreign lands, where they would begin to learn more about this world that had left them behind. As mentioned previously, the Drakthir were essentially a military first, and less a culture. But this didn't particularly mean they did not have a culture. It was just generally formed around this military-like structure. However, this evolved into a variety of practices, and created a sort of family system within the ranks of their army. From the junior ranks of the Drakthir army, known as a Talon, to the scale commanders, the Drakthir see Notharian not only as their general, but as a father figure, which is the reason why it's rather hard for them to accept that Notharian, or who would rather later be called Deathwing, became such a threat and had perished. Given the fact that he created them, that makes sense. Their culture also spread into caring for one another, as each member of a given warren saw each other as Pretty much clutch mates, brothers and sisters led by their scale commander. They'd have signets to keep on their horns, allowing for identification if they fell, allowing their names to not go forgotten. And this idea of making sure that the names of the fallen are not forgotten is something that's very strong and is shown even from the beginnings of their story and the ones that we can observe. In fact, three that we know of from the Healing Wings were known as Rethanesh, Tenzaneth, and Kartinasa, 
though as one might expect a force made for the sole purpose of war had little time to develop their own culture their own arts or even anything outside the concept of war however this doesn't mean that they are beyond expressing that or being rather innately skilled although perhaps sensitive depending on the individual to failure in these fields there is a town by the name of Ethrethi who was rather skilled in many fields and yet his self-consciousness and the nature of the director's creation built up on him mentally, leaving them easily susceptible to self-doubt upon any small failure. It was only through another drag there, delivering messages of praise from his would-be tutors, that he returned reinvigorated. Perhaps this isn't the case for all drag there, however, in a society built around war, perhaps it's quite a large side effect. Now, they do have recreational activities, which were created by the dragons, but are enjoyed by the Drakthir and the dragonkin alike. This recreational activity will be the sport of Lish Lorath, or Draconic for Talon Toss. This sport will be played in a circular arena of sorts, and would involve getting a ball, of which a few would appear in the center of the arena, into various goals. One goal in the center would give you one point, four goals further from the center would give you two points, and another four goals higher up would give you three points. In addition to this, the sport involved elements, with different goals giving different advantages to those who scored in them. One called the goal of searing pitch would rain down fire in the arena, and the goal of rushing winds, which would cause whirlwinds to appear across the arena respectively. So far, there's only one known arena, which is at the Algethar Academy in Thrald Razas in the Dragon Isles. And it seems that soon after the dragons returned to the Dragon Isles, the Black Dragon Flight had already formed a team there, known as the Dark Wings. Anyway, it's been rather fun talking about the Drag Theater. I do hope to one day get into more World of Warcraft lore and to talk about the Drag Theater later, but this is generally getting into an introduction to the characters and to the species as a whole. As always, a big thank you to my Patreons, Abyssal Blue, Aether Muse, ConquerFan91, Eric Manuel, Jabby, Kiasu Shin, Alaco312, Lazi, Nightmare Spyro, and Shaggy. I'll see you all the next time we talk. Stay safe, historians. <laughs>